Welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Matt Harris. We'll also find out a big bombshell. Hubie Brown tried to end the ban as early as 1962. This is going to be a really important conversation. I hope you check it out. We're also going to talk about the events that led to the 1949 First Presidency Statement. That's going to be a very interesting point as well. Finally, we're going to talk about Governor George Romney's attempts to run for the U.S. presidency. You may know his famous son, Mitt Romney, who's currently running for the U.S. Senate in Utah. Check out our conversation. Before you do that, I just want to remind everybody, please go to gospeltangents.com shop. This week only, you can get a transcript of Dr. Paul Reeve, Dr. Noel Bringhurst, or Dr. Darren Smith for just $6 each. So it's a special sale just this week in commemoration of the uh, end of the priesthood ban and temple ban on black members. Now back to our conversation. Let, let's jump into the 60s then, I guess. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, you know, the civil rights era. We can talk a little bit about President Benson. Um, t- take us there. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so that was the 50s with the Brown decision and uh, some rumblings in the CES system with students thinking about this. And um, I, I think nationally, uh, the, this racial story gets really highlighted when George Romney decides to run for the president. This is really interesting. He's the governor of a state that has a heavy African-American population. Now think about that for a moment. Your church doesn't grant priesthood rights to black people and you're running in a campaign for governor and you're having to convince people that you know you're not a racist or that somehow if you're elected that you won't listen to their needs and create public policy that will benefit their lives and when george romney is uh as governor when it's known that he's considering a run for the presidency it's pretty interesting because he a lot of the news media are writing about the LDS church priesthood ban and that Governor Romney may be a racist because his church is a racist. And pretty tough stuff. And George Romney, um, George Romney will, uh, will say something interesting. He'll say, if you want to know my views on race, look at my record when I was the governor. Look at me what I did with civil rights. So he cleverly sidesteps his church's racial teachings and puts the, the spotlight on him, which is truthfully probably what he should have done and what he did. And, um, but nonetheless, the media will continue to hammer this issue. And Spencer W. Kimball in particular, uh, he writes letters to various people, writes in his journal, and he says that the media is just killing us with George Romney. Is that all they ever want to talk about is the Negro issue? So he, they're very sensitive to this. And there are other... Um, Mormons uh, like Sterling McMurrin who are critical too nationally and they're getting a lot of national attention and Elder Kimball is just going crazy over this. Spencer <laughs> Kimball. Spencer Kimball. Then, then Elder really? Kimball. Really? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. He said, I wish the Sterling McMurrins of the world would leave us alone. He writes. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. And he also throws in another man we haven't talked about yet. He says the Sterling McMurrins and the Lowry Nelsons of the world would leave us alone. And Lowry Nelson is the man that is responsible for that 1949 First Presidency Statement. Um, just a quick bio on him. Born in Utah, taught at, went to school at BYU for a while. I think he graduated from BYU with his undergrad. And he uh, went to graduate school, I think at the University of Wisconsin in sociology. And so he's a Utah native. He taught at Utah State for a while and he spent majority of his career, spent some time in Florida, majority of his career at the University of Minnesota. And he was a fairly prominent uh, sociologist. And um, he had a friend named uh, Heber Meeks, who was the president of the Cuban mission. The brethren had asked Meeks to go open up this Cuban mission. And this would have been in the 19, mid-1940s. And Meeks knew uh, Lowry Nelson. They both grew up together. And recognizing that Lowry Nelson had spent time in Cuba as part of his professional, his field research, he decided to reach out to Nelson and ask him about Cuba and the racial population there. 
because Nelson had lived there for a while. And Lowry Nelson wrote back and just said, I don't think you can determine who's got Negroid blood, and you shouldn't even try. That's just immoral. And Nelson says something that's probably not less than candid. He said, that was the first time I knew that the church felt this way about this. And I come on, Lowry, <laughs> you grew up in the church. Anyway, so Lowry Nelson writes the first presidency um, after he exchanged correspondence with his good friend Heber Meeks. And he said, is it true that you're trying to establish a mission in Cuba and to just focus on the white population there and not the colored, the brown population? Is that true? And the first presidency wrote him back a series of letters. And they said, yes, that is true. And we don't understand why God wants this ban, but this is the way it is. And who are you to determine you know, what God should do? And Nelson was really upset with the response, thinking that it was just a policy that could be changed. But the brother and dug their heels in it, sort of exacerbated the problem. And when they wrote back to Lowry Nelson, it was the first time uh, where the first presidency goes on record. And they signed the state and the letters. It's interesting. They all signed these letters back and forth, all three of them, George Albert Smith, J. Reuben Clark, and David O. McKay. Hmm. And so clearly they're trying to make a statement about the church's racial teachings, at least by the mid-20th century. And so what's interesting is uh, he shares these letters on the underground with people. He sends it to Juanita Brooks. He sends them to George Boyd, who's the institute person. Sends them to all of these institute people that he felt like he had a liberal kinship with. And they write him back, oh my goodness, I didn't know the brethren felt this way. That they, they felt this strongly about it. And they were disappointed. And so there's this underground uh, where these, the, the Lowry Nelson correspondence of the first presidency, there's, I don't know, a dozen letters maybe total. Anyway, they get shipped around everywhere among uh, Mormon underground. And um, so people are getting a, a firsthand look at you know, what the, the leadership is thinking about this difficult issue. And President McKay is struggling with it. He signs his name to the letter. J. Room Clark wrote it, I mentioned. But President McKay signs his name to the letter and um, President McKay will have a very difficult uh, time with this. He'll maintain the status quo, but through the 1960s when civil rights is coming, maybe I should get to that point, but, um, but during the civil rights era, as George Romney's contemplating a presidential run, the NAACP in Utah, the Salt Lake City chapter, they're threatening to march on, on uh, Salt Lake City at Temple Square during conference because the church, for two reasons, the church hasn't agreed to support a national civil rights bill that had been working its way through Congress in the summer of 1963. And so the NAACP, they were upset that the church leadership, they couldn't understand why, why can't you support a civil rights bill? We understand your priesthood ban, but why not the civil rights bill? This just seems like the humane thing to do. And then the other thing was they were upset that um, the church had, or the state of Utah had some very draconian laws that dealt with racial, there's nothing to protect employment discrimination against black people. They were upset about that, that the state of Utah didn't practice um, what they call, didn't have a law that would um, protect fair practices in hiring as they called it. So you could discriminate based on your race in other words. So they were really pushing, putting pressure on the church both at the state and national levels. And in that context, Hubie Brown and, and, and Eldon Tanner, both of whom were in the first presidency by the early 60s, Henry Moyle had died and J. Rib Clark had died just a couple of years earlier. So these two men in the first presidency, they met with the NAACP and they said, let's strike a deal. If we agree to read a statement in general conference, this is October of 1963, just as all of this stuff is percolating. Um, if we agree to read a statement in general conference, offering support for civil rights, would you counsel the protest? And Johnny Driver, the leader of the NAACP at the time, um, agreed to do it. And so what's interesting is that the majority of the 12 didn't support civil rights, but Hugh Brown did, and Nathan Tanner did too. And so um, they go to President McKay, and they said, look, this is the deal we've reached. Are you, are you okay with this? And President McKay is a product of his generation, and he wasn't in favor of civil rights because he feared interracial marriage. That was his modus operandi. And um, President McKay didn't want the bad publicity from the march, distracting from general conference. And so reluctantly, he gives the green light for President Brown to read a statement in the October 1963 general conference session. What's interesting, though, he said to President Brown, he said, when you read the statement, make sure it's part of your larger talk. 
we don't want to give the impression that this is coming from the first presidency. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and Huey Brown, <laughs> funny guy, clever guy, completely ignored the boss's wishes. And <laughs> he, uh, he had great affection for President McKay. Um, but anyway, this time, at this point, he ignored President McKay, and he, he begins his talk. He says, I have a statement I wish to read. <laughs> <laughs> so he gives the impression that it's supported by the first presidency, which is not what President McKay wanted him to do. <laughs> Incorporate it into your talk. So he reads the statement. It's like two paragraphs. And then he pretty much says, now I'm going to begin my talk. <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting, uh, Apostle Kimball, Elder Kimball, will write in his journal, huh, the church supports civil rights, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> really? So he, I, I mean, I'd be a little flippant, but Elder yeah. Kimball writes that, you know, President Brown read a statement on civil rights today in conference, giving the church position. <laughs> really? Uh -huh. Giving the church position, yeah. which McKay specifically didn't want him to right. do. Right. He was downplay it because, you know, all the racial tension and all that stuff. And, and quite frankly, there's a number of them didn't, like I said, didn't believe in civil rights at the time. So anyway, that's what the, Hubie Brown was, um, was front and center in church leadership trying to get the brethren to overturn the ban. And he's working behind the scenes. He's doing the best that he can, but it's very, very challenging for him. And uh, in 1962, he will have a private meeting with Lowell Benyon, whom we've already talked about, who didn't support the ban and told President McKay in private. So it was no secret that you know, President McKay knew where Brother Benyon stood. Anyway, um, in March of 1962, Hubie Brown tells Lowell Benyon, he says, we're going to lift the ban here next month. Make sure you come to conference. 62? This is March of 62. Wow. Come to conference next month. We're going to lift the ban. So, so the prediction, of course, is in April of 62, we're going to have this big announcement at General Conference. We have been studying this issue, and there is nothing that is more difficult for the church, Brown tells Benyon, than this issue, and we're going to fix it. And so <laughs> I can only imagine Benyon showing up and nothing happens. And anyway, um, we don't know a lot of the details uh, behind the scenes, but clearly it's not lifted. And about six weeks after the, uh, the conference in 1962, Joseph Fielding Smith writes something in the church news that we're not lifting this ban. I mean, he's pretty clear about it. So I, I, I only read, as a scholar, I read that there's a lot of discussion about it and Brown President Brown likes to talk <laughs> I should tell you too he um, told the New York Times reporter the same thing they told Benyon we're gonna lift this ban this in 62 in 62 yeah. Wow yeah so this is now public and Elder Smith President Smith I guess he's president of the corner of the 12 by that point President Smith um, wants to reaffirm to the Saints who read the New York Times that this isn't gonna happen so anyway, um, in 1963, a whole year later, President Brown says the same thing again to Wallace Turner of the New York Times, we're going to lift the ban. And this time it, it, it creates a lot of hardship because Elder Smith is upset about this. He's talking publicly. These are private matters. And I'll let you speculate why he's talking to the media. This is really interesting. Can you imagine today, just pause for a moment, one of you know, the first presidency counselors talking to the media about some big policy change before it's been signed off and approved by the brother. And I mean, oh my goodness. So President Brown is, we can only imagine he's trying to put external pressure on the church, really. That's the law, one of the logical conclusions. So he talks to the, the, band, the, the reporter, and there's a, there's a man from, I um, can't remember the guy's name, but there's a, somebody from Salt Lake is there at the interview. And he's just like aghast when he hears President Brown talking. He's taking notes. <laughs> and he goes back to Salt Lake and he tells President McKay, did you know that President Brown gave an interview a couple of days ago? I was there. He said, we're going to lift the ban. I got the notes. Wow. <laughs> and poor, poor President Brown. He, he said he was misquoted. And uh, he was in a hardship. He wasn't misquoted. Wallace Turner had the entire transcript. And, uh, and plus the other guy was there from Salt Lake. And so President Brown, just in his heart of hearts, just felt very strongly that the ban wasn't scriptural and wasn't, in, you know, wasn't born out of divine revelation. It was just a policy that they had inherited that needed to be overturned. And as the civil rights movement moved along, I'll just make this our last comment here about this. Um, 
is that as the civil rights movement moved along, by the late 1960s, the church was under tremendous pressure to lift the priesthood ban, both inside and outside. Um, Sterling McMurrin is giving these public addresses to the NAACP that dozens of newspaper outlets are publishing. I mean, really presenting the church in a very unflattering light. And you've got um, a high profile Mormon official in the Jack Kennedy administration, and also Lyndon Johnson administration, he's a holdover into Johnson, a guy named Stuart Udall, who's the Secretary of Interior. And he goes public with his views about the ban, which is very interesting. So you've got Stuart Udall and then Sterling McMurrin, who was also in the Kennedy administration briefly. He was the Secretary of Education to Kennedy. And he realized that government politics wasn't for him. <laughs> so he went back to Salt Lake to be a professor. But nonetheless, you had these two uh, cabinet guys uh, and, and very prominent Mormons um, expressing public disapproval for the ban. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Matt Harris. In our next conversation, we've got a bit of a bombshell. A black man was almost ordained in 1969. Dr. Matt Harris tells us a little bit more. President McKay agrees to ordain a black man named Monroe Fleming, a loyal member at the Hotel Utah. This is in September of 1969. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So he agrees to ordain Monroe Fleming to the priesthood. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you like our page on facebook.com slash gospel tangents. You can subscribe at YouTube at youtube.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at gospel tangents, as well as make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our videos. Thanks again.